Hello, everyone. I am Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. Perpetual Chess is a weekly chess interview show where we talk with accomplished chess players, authors, and personalities about their lives, their careers, and how to improve at chess. Perpetual Chess is brought to you through the generosity of its Patreon and PayPal supporters and by Chessable.com. Hey, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. We have two guests for the price of one this week. I am excited to, to uh, talk with them. We have uh, Grandmaster Peter Wells, who is a popular British chess author, trainer, and competitor. He earned the GM title in 1994 and won the British Rapid Play Championship in 2002, 2003, and 2007, among many other accolades. Uh, Dr. Her- Barry Heimer will also be joining us. He is a researcher, consultant, and author of 10 books. He's also a passionate chess enthusiast who, by the way, has seen his rating go from the equivalent of 1780 FIDE or so to about 2035, so while in his 50s. So I think it's safe to call him an adult improver as well. And together they're out with a brand new book called Chess Improvement. It's all in the mindset. It's um, packed with information. It's um, sort of a didactic book more than a a how-to manual. So there is some chess games in it, but it's mostly about sort of the philosophy of chess learning, um, chess parenting, um, growth mindset, of course, which we'll be talking about and defining. And it has a great foreword by none other than Henry Carlson, of course, the father of uh, uh, world champion Magnus Carlson. So without further ado, let's let's hear from them. So um, welcome to Barry and Peter. How are you, Barry? Uh, very good. Thank you very much, Ben, for the introduction and the offer to um, to be to be joining with you. So great fun for me. Thank you. Yes, and welcome, Peter, as well. Thanks very much. It's great to be here. Thank you, Ben. Sure. Yeah. And this is this book. Someone, uh, apologies, I can't remember who it was. Um, one of uh, my Twitter friends, as soon as they saw the headline about this book, they pinged me and said, um, "Hey, these guys are tramping on your territory." because this book is a sort of the exact sort of thing that we talk about all the time here on Perpetual Chess, which means I'm super excited to interview you guys because we we know that uh, the science of chess improvement is somewhat, we, we have some guesses about what's the best way to approach it, but it's also, we don't have all the answers figured out. So to have um, a player of your stature, Peter, and a researcher of your stature, Barry, devote 300 plus pages to this question is is welcome. Um, so without further ado, let's let's dive into the book. So why don't we start, of course, with the genesis of the project. So um, who's, who's germ of an idea was this? I think we I think we, we can safely claim to to share this, uh, Ben. We, um, we we got together at the British Championships um, just over four years ago in in Bournemouth, and uh, over a a good meal uh, and uh, probably more beers than we want to remember. <laughs> um, we we just kind of threw the idea around with a good friend of ours, Tim Kett, uh, and it seemed like um, it seemed like uh, it could be could be of interest to the chess playing community. Um, obviously, I don't have the chess credentials that uh, people like Peter um, does have, um, but I do come from the background on the on the research side, and I wanted to see if there was going to be any interesting mileage between the two. And um, Peter got it; he'd come across Carol Dweck already, and he can speak for himself about his interest in the in the in the idea. Okay, and Carol Dweck is someone we should uh, clarify her place in sort of the canon of educational research uh, before we go any further. So um, either one of you is welcome welcome to to uh, summarize her research a bit. Well, Carol Dweck has been working in the field for um, about 40 years. She's a developmental psychologist. Uh, for the last decade plus, she's been based at Stanford University, uh, though a lot of her earlier work was um, when she was based in, in New York. Um, and what she's been interested in for, for many, many years is uh, what, what are the beliefs that can help or hinder um, our behavior as learners? And um, she's come up with this notion of, of mindset. Uh, it was originally called something much less intuitive. She used to talk about entity theories of intelligence and incremental <laughs> theories of intelligence. And you can see how that caught on in the world. Yeah, that um, didn't sell she, very many yeah, books. <laughs> no, no, no. And then she then she shifted to the uh, the concept of mindset, and you know, as a pre-existing word, um, it had an existing currency, but she's given it her own stamp and uh, a really, really strong research uh, tradition behind that too. Yeah, strong enough that I, as a 
chess player and just, you know, um, I read a fair amount, but it's not my field of research. And I had come across the the research and read the book a few years ago. And my older kid is is seven and it's it's penetrated the discourse enough where they explicitly teach a mindset um, approach to these kids, which of course I think is wonderful. So yeah, it's definitely uh, a welcome addition to the chess world, especially in a game that can be so results oriented. Uh, so Peter, what was your, so you guys agreed to do this project. What was your familiarity with the uh, mindset research at the outset of the project? Well, fortunately, as Barry said, I had read something by Carol Dweck uh, maybe a couple of years before, I think it was, you know, relatively fresh in my mind still. And I was quite impressed by it because as um, as I try to explain in the book, I, I think I, my chess development had been hindered at various points by psychological blockages. So I was actually, you know, I was reading it partly as a general reader, but also with a distinct um, intention of trying to help myself as a chess player. So I knew a little bit about Carol Dweck, enough to, I think, engage in a reasonably, well, as, as much of an intelligent conversation as was acquired after the number of beers Barry mentioned. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so we were in a position where, yeah, he could see at least that I had some interest in the subject and some familiarity. And yeah, I was, I was, um, I, again, as is explained in the book at some point, I had some initial reservations about how easily this research was going to transfer into this field of chess. As, as again, is said in the book, but partly I think because you know, just stories about Magnus Carlsen, you, you sometimes get into the kind of popular psychology of Magnus Carlsen, you know, the guy laid back, doesn't work that hard, all this kind of thing, which I think is actually not a very accurate portrayal. And so, but once I'd convinced myself that, you know, mindset could be applied to chess, the project was very exciting for me. Um, yeah. And we'll be digging into sort of uh, the, the the chess implications, the broader chess implications. Uh, we've got some good uh, Patreon listener questions on that topic. But but before we do that, Peter, and you're quite open about this in the book to your credit, but obviously since the book is brand new, uh, most of our listeners will not have read it. I, I did um, read it and learn a lot. So, but Peter, could you, could you just tell us a little more about the psychological issues that you discuss? I'm sure lots of people will be able to relate um, being that most of us aren't even grandmasters. Well, I mean, I think for me, a lot of it comes down to time trouble. I think a great deal of it, you know, and and obviously when you're when you're facing time trouble and it's holding you back demonstrably over a period of time, you have to start to try and address, you know, why this is happening. Um, and you know, there are po various possible causes of time trouble, but I think you know some kind of perfectionism is 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 likely to be one of them. And that was really my starting point for myself. And you know, at this point, Carol Dweck had an incredibly interesting insight by describing different kinds of perfectionism. And this didn't get me massively forward in the sense I was pretty sure I was guilty of both of them. <laughs> but, but actually, one of them I view more positively than the other. One of them I don't particularly want to eradicate. The other I would like to see purged even at my advanced age. But it's, it's, proving, it's always proved a tough call. Um, so perfectionism was part of it. Um, and also, I think, you know, some problems with decision making, clearly. Um, and... Also, I, I identified, you know, I was trying to be brutally honest at this point, I identified probably some imposter syndrome, some feeling that you you haven't quite merited your achievements or, or you know, it's, it's difficult to describe why that comes about. I don't see anything in my, you know, I had, my parents were supportive and they were great. I don't find something in my background that obviously leads to it, but I was pretty, it became clearer to me while writing, while researching for the book that imposter syndrome was probably something I was suffering from as well at the point. Yeah, well, all of it, I think, is very relatable, certainly for me and likely for a lot of others as well. So um, is it, I mean, especially with the uh, the pandemic still in full force and limited OTB play, I, is it possible for you to assess how this has impacted your game, Peter, or is it too, too early to tell? How, how much the book impacted? I think, I think I could tell a bit because we were writing it over quite a lengthy period. Um, so I think that it made me, I think Barry got the concept absolutely right at one point where he said I was a little gentler on myself. I think it made me a little less judgmental and it helped It helped me realise the importance of a kind of fairly positive self-narrative, obviously while you're playing, but actually outside of playing as well. I think I'm a little less harsh on myself. Okay. Having, yeah. having written the book and I think actually that's very important. 
I think yeah. you know, you, 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 it's, I think it's very important that you know, the, the Soviet school obviously is right that it's very important to be self-critical and to analyze your mistakes. But at the end of the day, you actually don't want to be beating yourself up at the same time. Yeah, it's a, it's a fine line to walk between wanting yeah. to learn from the experience without just, uh, you know, beating yourself up over it. Yeah. So um, we've got a lot of uh, listener questions. So Patreon supporters, Patreon and PayPal supporters, thank you for all the great questions so that I can be sure that we get to them all. I'm going to dive right in. So the first one is from longtime friend of the show, Peter Newhall. Uh, and Peter asks, and he was just going based on, you know, reading the... Uh, the sort of um, capsule and the the web page for the book and stuff like that. So this is I don't think this question is intended as any sort of um, detailed critique, uh, just a clarification. Peter says, it's hard to tell what information the book contains. Is it primarily about growth mindset as it applies to chess? Is it primarily academic? Does it contain granular how-to recommendations on creating improvement plans? And Barry, why don't you take that one if you're up for it? Yeah, thank you. It's a, it's, it's a good question to uh, kind of prize open the, the the purposes of the book and and in fact how it's how it turned out in the end. Uh, it is primarily about growth mindset as it applies to chess. Uh, we do make the point early on that a number of chess writers and thinkers and players have um, referenced uh, mindset uh, at least obliquely uh, in in their work. Boris Gulko, Boris Gelfand. Uh, as we as we know, to positively bleed mindset insights in in pretty much every interview uh, they give and every every book they write. Um, but we hadn't come across um, any particular text which had used mindset as the whole architecture um, for 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 for, for dis discussion on chess. Uh, so so we thought there was going to be um, likely to be interest in particularly focusing on connecting the the theory of mindset and indeed learning theory more generally with how this pans out in the chess context. Um, there is some theory. Um, each of the um, seven chapters in the book um, starts with a, a little theoretical overview. Um, I, I hope I hope we've managed to um, give that a, a real accessible twist rather than something too dense and impenetrable. Um, and though we do obviously make connections to the chess element in the theory, um, it's the second section in each chapter which Peter's taken responsibility for, which develops that in much more detail, uh, particularly looking at uh, the work that he's done uh, with elite players uh, over the years. And I should say we do draw very heavily on the contributions of um, pretty much uh, all of the uh, top uh, English uh, players um, in the last uh, 20, 30 years, uh, with one or two exceptions. Um, and 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 so that's the that's the that's the practical angle that it takes. And the very end of each chapter uh, is a very short section, which uh, Tim Kett was largely responsible for writing for us, where he synthesizes a lot of the ideas and a lot of his experience as a as a chess coach and trainer in terms of particular um, particular uh, recommendations for parents and coaches. But it's not granular in the sense of we provide a kind of a how to join the dots exercise. Um, Henry Carlson, I think, absolutely nailed it when he observed that what the book is is not a how-to guide. Uh, it's an exercise in in metacognition in itself. In in, in other words, just um, allowing chess players and chess parents and chess coaches to plan a route that will more, be more likely to work for themselves in terms of the work that they do for themselves and indeed for a younger player. Yeah, and just to expound on that a little bit from from my perspective, having read it, Peter, definitely not a how to study plan in terms of like we always talk about how to divide your study time and stuff like that. And um, everyone's, you know, people's there's some um, consensus on recommendations, but obviously it's not complete. But there are actionable tips in terms of like how to how to judge your own performance and and stuff along those lines. So. There is some how to, but it's not, it's uh, more, I would say, on a micro than a, a macro level. And Henry Carlson, I agree, his, his introduction is amazing. I mean, and he did an interview. I would love to interview him someday. I haven't, I haven't attempted yet, but um, he did an amazing interview with us. I am Sagar Shah of Chess Base India uh, that you can find on YouTube a couple years ago. And yeah, you can really see, I mean, you might, one might think from the outside without studying it that they had this like hard driving mindset but as as he describes in the forward he's just um he basically tried to stay out of the way almost to the point where it's like for me it's it's almost hard to believe which i sense from you peter what, what you were saying about magnus earlier about how of course he has he's 
has a well-deserved reputation as a genius, but um, you were saying maybe he doesn't get credit for for the work that he p puts in. So, what is it, uh, Peter, that makes you re that made you reassess that? Um, well, it was a number of things. One of them was talking to uh, Gawain Jones, who gave me a strong feeling that the kind of work that Magnus does is probably is, is underestimated. You know, I think that one problem people have they tend to equate work with opening preparation so you see these players who come to the game with very heavy opening preparation and that leads to a kind of automatic assumption that they are the hard workers but i think one of the messages from the book is that you know work on varied aspects of the game in in varied ways is 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 the way to go and that too much concentration on opening preparation or too much concentration on the very sort of computerized um, ritualized learning version of opening, of computer preparation is not the way to go. You want to be working on all aspects of the game. You want to be identifying your weaknesses, but also working on your strengths. There are a number of, you know, I think that, I think it's, there are actionable sort of ways of thinking about your work. There are ways that you, it's very important. The, the, the main conclusion of the book, I think, in, in a sense, is that thinking deeply about your work is probably the most important thing you can do. You know, we kind of started off with this basic mindset idea that your belief about the possibility of progress is the key. And I'd say if we if you wanted to put in a sentence one other ad element we added, it's that the way you how you think about your work and thinking deeply about it is the way to make it useful. You know, it's not the it's very clear in the book that just loads of work for the sake of work is not helpful. And that I think we are quite specific on on certain ways of thinking which will encourage you to work more effectively. Right, which sort of gets to the concept of of deliberate practice, which yes. which I'd I'd like to discuss too, but just a, a bit more on on Magnus because uh, I know Erwin Lemy, who's been on the show earlier this year, he also sort of said Magnus has this uh, long time reputation of uh, not um, you know not knowing the openings as well as some other players, and of course, famously when he trained with Kasparov. Um, you know, it was said that they they worked together for a while, but it was said that they didn't have exactly the same style because Kasparov was very concrete in terms of how he approaches openings, and that especially at the time wasn't Magnus's um, approach. But I mean, now that Magnus has like a full team in place and a bigger budget than anyone um, and more to protect than anyone, I, I do think that um, and maybe just his thinking has evolved. I mean, players who are more qualified to judge than me uh, all say that his opening prep and knowledge is, is as good as anyone's. Um, and, and as you guys say, of course, there's more to the game than that. And, um, one, one other thing that's just evident is how much he loves chess that he's playing, playing blitz and bullet on the rest days and stuff like that. And that sort of all ties into a, to a growth mindset is just wanting to do it. Um, so what, what do you think for any parents listening in this Barry or Peter, you guys are welcome to take this. What, what can we learn from the approach of, uh, of uh, the Carlson family. Well, it's uh, it's it, it's great having a, a role model like Magnus for for, for one thing, uh, and and because he's so open about the interviews he gives, you you get a lot of insight into how he's actually operating. Um, he's, he's got a lovely, as as you might expect, kind of Scandi um, modesty. Um, with, with a kind of a, a delightful overlay of charm as well. But if you really listen to what he's saying, he, he's talking about being driven by a, a primary passion for the game. Um, he's obviously done very well financially uh, out of chess. Um, but, but he says, you know, I've, I've got as much money as I'm likely to need in my life. If I, if I didn't find chess fun, I'd, I'd, I'd be out of here and, and um, spending my life on the beach or playing football with, um, you know, friends from Liverpool Football Club. But but he's not. I mean, he's, he's sticking to the chess world out of reasons of intrinsic motivation. So I think the, the, the big take home that any parents or young chess player or indeed any improving adult chess player will take from Magnus was, um, you know, be led by the passion, uh, not, not, by, not, not by the achievements that you, you, you've got, either in rating terms or in world championships. Be led by the passion and let those other things follow as secondary gifts. Yeah, great advice. And uh, kind of um, piggybacking off of that, I'm going to dive into the next uh, question from the Patreon mailbag. Um, and this one is from Ewan Richardson who says, hi, I'm a 24-year-old PhD student getting back into chess after rediscovering my love for it as a child. 
My emphasis is on improvement with a lifetime goal of going from beginner to expert. My main issue is that with my day to day spent on research, I'm often tired by the even evening, excuse me. And given how mentally taxing proper chess study is, I often do less meaningful chess training like puzzles. I can only imagine how bringing up a family on top of a day job does to your energy stores. What's your advice for finding the mental energy to devote to and then in quotes, real study like game analysis, studying books, et cetera. And I don't know, either one of you, I think are qualified to answer this, so. Um, it's just, a, it's just a, a, you know, it's a great, it's a great question. Um, my, my own personal request to, to you and would be, um, don't do what I did which was give up chess at the point that career and family seem to leave no time for it. I did uh, that but, too. Yeah. <laughs> right. And, you know, I, I regretted it. I took the best part of 35 years out and I completely um, excised chess from my life. I, I, if you'd asked me 20 years ago who the world champion was, I would have guessed Kasparov, but I, I hadn't read chess columns or anything. And the reason was, I think in my early 20s, I had a very strong fixed mindset about it. And when it became clear to me that I wasn't going to achieve what I thought I would like to achieve in the chess world, I thought, well, you know, sod this. I'm 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 out of here, and I'm going to give my priority to um to to things like family and 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 career. Um, but but I would also say um there is no easy answer to putting time into into chess. Um, if if there were a horrible horrible phrase, a kind of a magic. Um, energy tree that we can get mental energy from at the end of a busy day at work. Um, we, we, don't, we don't offer that. Um, the, the most we can offer is a, a guide towards the kind of things that are worth spending your time on um, and the kind of things that are perhaps not worth spending your time on. Uh, by the way, I probably wouldn't include puzzles in that. I think puzzles can yeah, be... Yeah, I, I, I thought that too. Yeah, and no, puzzles can be very useful and, you know, Follow things like uh, woodpecker method uh, methods and, and and the programs that Chessable uses can, can be really helpful in in in, in addressing um, chess improvement. But as Ewan does correctly say, there's some tough stuff which isn't necessarily going to be enjoyable, which we need to get to grips with uh, at some point too. Um, but that will be a decision any player will make. They they will have to make you know tough decisions around where do they invest their limited and very finite time and it won't always be in heavy analysis yeah uh, and i greatly related to what uh you and to you and's question i'm 43 and have two young kids so i'm so much more tired at night and i i am trying to not even i, I eventually would like to to improve from uh my prior strength but right now i just want to get back some some lost strength i'll start i'll i'll settle for that at first but i definitely related to what he said and i've of course said this many times that it's i don't mind uh studying um i don't mind the fairly routine review of openings or even some basic tactics but when it comes to really hard work um i find it hard to do that and um i'm sure my my chess um is worse for the wear because of it um and I don't, I don't think there's any easy answers. Um, uh, another question I sort of... Ben, ben, sorry, could I just add to that? Yeah, of course. Because it occurred to me that there's a couple of things here. One phrase, proper chess study. I mean, it, it, I, I relate to that in the sense that we were trying to delineate, you know, things that are really going to make a substantial difference from those that are not. But it's uh, one of the other messages of the book, I hope, was that there isn't a very rigid path. And there are quite a number of uh, things which are pleasurable and at the same time make a big difference. And I think most of the players we interviewed found that, you know, reading chess books and absorbing almost subliminally is one of the significant ways in which they gathered useful chess knowledge. And that, I think, is something which probably can still be done at the end of a hard day in the way that, you know, very rigorous training, very rigorous sort of self-analysis and stuff probably can't. So I think, you know, that... There is bound to be a trade-off. You're going to have to uh, put in a certain amount of tough stuff if you want to make very serious progress. But there is a lot that can be done within the bounds of, you know, keeping it fun as well. And reading good quality chess books, particularly ones with lots of explanation and ones which, you know, really really guide you rather. And and of course, as as Luke said rather cheekily reading your chess books without the use of a chess board is very good for your memorization. He said he did it for reasons of laziness, but actually it's an incredibly useful tool. You learn a lot by reading a book and, and trying to memorize it in your head. 
And I, I mean, yeah, I have huge me. sympathy with chess, Chessable and software, which is greatly aiding the ability to read books in a very convenient and pleasant manner. But the old fashioned reading a book and keeping it in your in your head at the same time still has its place, I think. And and is obviously something which you can do in a state of semi semi tiredness, I think. Okay, good advice. Yeah, and just to clarify, he, he of course is referring to Grandmaster Luke McShane. Luke McShane, as uh, Peter and Barry have said, they interviewed so many of the top players in Great Britain, which uh, provided great insight in the book. And the other thing that came to mind hearing you discuss this, Peter, is you you guys talk in the book about the concept, um, which I think will be familiar to most listeners, of uh, deliberate practice, but. You kind of debate the the question of whether deliberate practice kind of needs to be inherently uncomfortable because you're pushing yourself. So, what what do you think, Barry? Does it need to be? Do you does it need? Does there need to be a torture element in order to do deliberate practice? Yeah, it's it's it's, it's a really interesting one. This, and I think Peter and I both enjoyed uh, knocking this one around because um, the 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 world of of deliberate practice, which comes largely from the work of of Anders Ericsson and and, and his colleagues. Um, at, at that time at, at Florida University, uh, giving us concepts which are quite well known, at, like the 10,000 hour rule, which Malcolm Gladwell popularized in his best selling book, Outliers. Uh, he, he talks about deliberate practice as being inherently um, not particularly enjoyable. And that's what distinguishes the uh, gains made by really serious professionals. Um, really committing to this as, as a kind of work element. Uh, and those of us who are kind of happy amateurs, you know, trying to get a bit of fun out of the game and, and, and hoping we improve as well. Um, and there's, there's quite a heated debate in academic circles between, you know, have the, have the zealots in, in deliberate practice uh, overstated the case around how important the environment and the right kind of practice is? Um, or is there now kickback from the geneticists saying, you know, in the end, it all comes down to, to basic ability and talent. Um, and, and, and Peter had a very nice little play around, particularly using Magnus Carlsen as the example over here, because some of the kickback to the deliberate practice um, uh, researchers has been using Magnus as an exemplar of someone who seems to um, get by without putting the same work in that the Karuanas and the, the Anish Giris and, and others and, and Maxime and, and others are, are, are known to be putting in. Um, and, and, and what Peter did, I think, rather neatly was um, just tap into some of the assumptions that are made in the critique. Uh, for instance, um, that because he says he doesn't spend a lot of time, um, you know, playing against computers, um, therefore, this is this is clear evidence that he uh, he's, he's not a worker. Well, Peter makes the point, and particularly from his background as a second to some top players, um, playing against the computer, Matthew Sadler accepted, is probably quite a rare uh, activity amongst top GM practice. Um, but things like the fact that he enjoys kicking a ball around and is well known to be, you know, quite quite an athlete um, is, is, is at best a problematizing variable because, you know, fitness is, is something which has sustained him during the, you know, the rigors of his, of his chess career. Uh, Peter, do you want to kind of unpack any of that in, in any more detail? Um, I think you've said most of it, but I had the feeling, yeah, that, again, it comes down to problems of defining what really constitutes work. And the other thing to add to this is that people clearly learn by playing. And, you know, you look at the academic literature on on, on that kind of thing, and, and it sometimes takes the hours of study as the variable. It sometimes takes the hours of playing, but it very rarely kind of integrates all of it. And, and of course, there's a huge amount of, as the book is trying to say throughout there's a huge amount of variation in how effectively people work you know if people are putting in 10,000 bad hours they're not going to make it so you know <laughs> right. it's, it's very important that the quality of the work is there as well as the quantity and that some of these peripheral things are well not peripheral actually but uh, things that may not necessarily get counted such as casual reading or playing lots of games and, I, and I, you know I think we can safely exclude things like bullet but rapid chess, right. rapid chess and sort of probably even blitz chess with an increment, something like that, maybe qualify as things where you're going you're gonna to be learning something. And I think in all of these things, as long as you take some time to reflect on the experience afterwards and trying to think about what you've learned from it, which I think it would probably be the, the, um, the, the deal breaker for lots of blitz games. I'm sure lots of games right. happen where no one reflects at all. But if you do take that little bit of extra time, 
then you can turn lots of activities which appear kind of semi-frivolous into quite serious learning tools. And I think Magnus has, you know, probably learnt to all of these means. And it's very, very difficult for the those critiquing Ericsson and trying to put things back onto a more genetic footing to, to, to really capture the different ways in which someone like Magnus has absorbed his chat. Yeah, and we do have an interesting question relating to the genetic footing, but I don't want to I don't want to get to that one yet because I actually what I what I would like to hear about next is um Peter, you've talked about your own experience um with uh with uh trying to improve um a, as an adult uh working adult and Barry, you've you've made some progress. So, I want to get to that in a second, but first um let's take a break and hear from our aforementioned friends at Chessable. As always, Perpetual Chess is proud to be brought to you in part by Chessable.com. Chessable is a chess learning website that utilizes its move trainer technology to help you learn and remember opening lines, tactical patterns, and end games. It is endorsed by GM Magnus Carlson and features courses from I am John Bartholomew, Sam Shanklin, Wesley So, and so many others. Chessable has over 100,000 members and features hundreds of courses, both for free and for purchase. So if you haven't checked it out yet, please go to chessable.com and take a look around. Back to the interview. So Barry, over 200 points in your 50s. Um, that That's pretty impressive. So first of all, congratulations. Um, I, I would gladly sign up for that um, when, when with my 50s, my next decade down the pike. Um, and number two, how have you what's your study regimen? I mean, how do you apply all of this knowledge that you have about this domain to, to your own chess pursuits? Uh, th- thank you, Ben. I'll, at my age, I'll take any congratulations from, from whichever quarter. And, and, <laughs> and that's, that's, that's a great one to get. Um, there's an interesting link here, I think, between between the the previous question we were addressing. There, there was a lovely comment that, that Luke made in his interview where he said, some people are just lucky to enjoy work. And you know, if you if you really enjoy the game, as as clearly Luke has done from a young age, what some people might regard as work um, for the Lukes of this world is just is just real fun, and 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 maybe this problematizes the uh, research around deliberate practice as well. So when I came back into the chess world uh, around about four or five years ago, um, I, I felt very very much like I'd been left behind. You know, things have gone on so much in terms of databases, engines, uh, really well-developed defensive technique, which I don't remember encountering with my Max Lange attacks and with the best <laughs> gambits, you know, back in my heyday of the late 70s, uh, where people would crumble and fall for cheapos. Um, th- that doesn't seem to happen uh, nowadays. And, and a large part of that, I think, is because the tools of chess improvement have have got so good and, and, and people have become really, really adroit in these in these areas. So I realized I needed to, you know, go back and 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 and, and learn some skills around that. But but the main thing was um I'd I'd spent the uh, chess latency years um learning about uh learning uh and chess psychology uh, without ever relating it to chess. But when I came back into the chess world I thought hang on, you know why am I why am I considering giving up chess again after one bad result in a tournament over here? What have what have I been telling people about growth mindset for for the last twenty odd years? Uh, and I, I simply started applying these principles myself and and not beating myself up too much when I you know played a crass move or got uh, a really poor score in a tournament and and try to try to use these as learning opportunities. But the the main thing I think was I, I decided in my mature years in my then late 50s as an as an adult was not to worry about ratings um just enjoy the game uh and enjoy putting the work into the game and try not to see it as work uh and 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 see what happens um so so in that sense i never really had a a self-improvement plan which was based on getting 200 elo points uh, over the next x years it was just kind of get back into the game regret the years that i'd been uh, absenting myself from it uh, and see what happens. Uh, so, so in that sense, I can genuinely say you know, those rating points have have cropped up because my understanding of chess has improved over the period that I've been investing time and effort in it. Yeah, there's something about the laws of attraction at work there, where when you when you release the urge for something, then it comes to you. But yep. but if you but if you fervently chase it, then then it's yep. uh, it's harder to get. But I, I'm still curious, Barry, like what you actually do in terms of um, your chess sure. study. 
Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm a child of my time. So until I fairly recently got into the chessable world, and, and, and that, that's been a revelation for me, and, and, and not just because I work for them. I hope I'd be saying that independently. Um, I, I, I was very much going back to my old books. Over time, I started getting uh, new books as well. Um, I started spending less time on my openings. Um, I, I, I no longer um, use the same openings that I did before. I tended to go for universal systems, partly because at my age, um, memory can be a factor. Um, I think you can still play good chess and certainly improve considerably in, in your 50s. Uh, but there's no question that it's, it's harder to retain things than it was when you're you know, a teenager and in your early 20s. So I kind of moved over to deeper strategic understanding of universal systems. So I come across, you know, Neil McDonald's wonderful book on the King's Indian attack. Uh, and, and, and actually, I learned a lot about positional play, which has always been my weakness uh, when I was younger, um, through um, reflecting on, on, on my learnings there. And in the same time, learning a system which I could use and adapt. Uh, for a period, I used things like uh, 1B6 or 1G6 in response to anything. Um, and, and really then spent the time that I saved on having to memorize badly, you know, really sharp Sicilian night of poison pawn variations um, on, on playing through master games, learning from the classics, all the old advice, which is still, I believe, as good and as fresh now as it, as it was when, when, when I was a kid and, and learning chess, learning chess myself and then playing, you know, entering tournaments playing in a section probably a little bit too strong for me, but not way too strong for me. Um, to this day, uh, I, I, I tend only to enter open sections where I know I'm going to get a thumping. I know I'm not going to find one opponent who's going to be an easy kill. I'm going to aim to get 50% in an open. I sometimes manage that. I sometimes even exceed it. Um, and I'm going to feel okay about uh, not winning the big prizes. Um, and, and happily, you know, things seem to seem to have been working so far. Um, I'm, I'm nowhere near the level that I'd like to be. Um, but uh, again, you know, I'm going to let that follow my my continued love of the game. Yeah. And playing tougher competition, that's something really important that doesn't come up maybe as much as it should. And here in the U.S., we, have, of course, have a very capitalist chess system, not surprisingly, um, where uh, the, the biggest organizer, Bill Gortzberg, I mean, he, he does a great job running a smooth tournament, but um, below the open level, it's still very money oriented. So the the entry fees are high. And the prizes can be like in, you know, there can be an under 1800 prize of $10,000 at the biggest one uh, world open. Um, so people get enticed by that and they kind of pursue the short term goal rather uh, at the expense of the long term goal, um, which, you know, obviously fits into this um, research about that would not be an example of pursuing the growth mindset. But uh, absolutely. Yeah, but, I, I think I think there's a massive category error with that. I yeah. mean, what it's doing is it's putting chess too much in association with earning big money. And if there's one way to be disappointed in life, unless you're a madness of this world, it's going to be playing chess because of the money it brings you. You know, it's uh, it, it's got to have deeper root from that. Yeah, although I will say, and I understand the impulse because the entry fees can be so much that it, it leaves a mark. I mean, it's, it's sure. 300 bucks and you're traveling somewhere. You might need sure. to pay for hotels. So we might be talking about like close to $1,000 to play in this tournament. So um, to just like purely write that off as growth mindset is that that's a stretch depending on your financial situation. So, sure. so I get it. But on the other hand, um, I do think that it, it's something to call attention to. And Peter, of course, you're a trainer as well and have worked with many strong young players. So I'm curious as you process all of this research and think about this project, how you think it will impact um, wh what you teach uh, the, the next generation and the adult improvers that you you work with. Well, I think, I mean, at the moment, I've been mostly working with the kind of strongest tier of juniors in England. Um, that's basically been my one, one of my roles for the last couple of years. And, well, I've, I think how I've, how I've used the research fitted quite nicely with my role designation, which was kind of to be a mentor rather than purely a coach. And that seemed to me to fit very well with trying to get them to focus on the methods by which they work rather than just you know presenting lots of chess material in itself so i've got i actually got a bunch of quite young children regularly annotating their own games and doing so in a way which was okay self-critical but also discussing very closely 
um, their thinking processes, why they chose certain moves over others, you know, trying to avoid uh, them, them just checking their games with the computer, that kind of thing. So I think that was part of it. I've also, another thing I mentioned in the book, and which we touched on earlier, why I don't think lots and lots of tactics problems are really the best way to improve, because I think I've tried to put a big focus on kind of tactical triggers, things which make you realize while you're playing that there's a tactic there. You know, if you're being told in a tactics book that there's tactics, then then you're on the lookout. But one of the big challenges while you're playing a game is to be is to be looking out for tactics, to know when to look, to know how to apportion your time on particular positions. And all these things I've, I've tried to work. OK, they're all part of, I think, a good coach's repertoire in any case. But since working on the book, they've been hugely emphasized in the work I've done. But I think that's partly been facilitated by who I was working with. I think, you know, if you're working with children at different levels, there may be different emphases you want to take. And with adult improvers, again, there might be a different approach. I think one of the big questions, which was sort of touched upon by you just now in your discussion of the costs of playing in, in tournaments in the US, one of the things it's worth mentioning is that our advice is, and, and it's, again, I think Barry says it in a nice footnote in the book, our advice is very much geared towards people for whom improvement is, is the key point. If you're trying to, you know, win prizes to cover your costs or if you're just trying to okay enjoyment is a big part of what we're trying to promote as well but if you're just sort of enjoying it for the sake of it and not particularly trying to improve then some of what we're saying probably isn't relevant we are trying to speak to the people for whom improvement is the primary goal and you know i think again when you're when you're coaching adults there may be some who want to solve a specific on-hand problem but aren't sort of looking at whether their chess is going to be in a much better state in five years' time or something, I think it's important to adapt a little bit to the goals of the people you're coaching. But I've been fortunate that the goals of the people I've been working with in the last couple of years have very much been focused on improvement. And I think the sort of methodology in the book has, has been tremendously helpful, actually. Yeah, and what you mentioned about tactics trainers is is a really good point. Um, that, yeah, it's, um, it's so... It's so easy when you know, I mean, not so easy, but it's a lot easier when you know something's there. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to follow up on uh, the state of British, British chess, since you mentioned you're working with a lot of the top juniors in um, in uh, Great Britain. And of course, I've been lucky enough to have some of the, the giants um, of the game from Great Britain, like uh, the aforementioned Matthew Sadler and David Howell. Um, but we have a question from supporter of the podcast, Jonathan Slater. Who asks? He says, "Why does Peter think there are no, no young GMs in Britain? Is it a numbers game, a missing wave of cultural enthusiasm, or more to do with the current lack of organization and poor financial incentives for promising young players? And what solutions would you offer?" Yeah, I think that's a that's a very good question, and it's one which I pondered long before I was uh, on, on, um, in this particular role. I think it's a mixture of things, unsurprisingly, and perhaps not very interestingly. I think that it, you know. I think there have been issues with organization and, you know, there've been a variety of different coaching schemes which have kind of started and not really stayed the course. But I also have for a long time felt that, you know, the, the state of professional chess in, in well, in the, the whole UK, I suppose, has been one in which a very large number of strong players who are still, those who are still playing are chasing a pretty small pot of money and a small number of, you know, high level tournaments. So I have been troubled by the issue of the sort of incentives for young players to put in the work necessary to make it over a period of time. And that's obviously a broader, more systemic problem, which I, I, I'm not in a position to address myself. I think there are some promising developments. I think there have been some more um, because you, you kind of need, as I say in the book, you need a mix of tournaments. You need some sort of weekend tournaments which which provide useful practice you also need strong long tournaments and there's been a bit of a shortage of the latter in the UK and even one or two of the tournaments which sort of have a, a UK link like the Isle of Man or Gibraltar have actually become slightly more forbidding to enter in recent years so there is a problem with you know the kind of tournaments which I played in when I was was a kid things like the Lloyds Bank Masters they were fantastic opportunity you know reliably every year of my life between sort of 1980 and 1994, something like that. This amazing tournament in London with very, very strong players coming. And, and you know, it's where I first saw Morozevich, people like that. There was tremendous inspiration from that. And that's kind of gone a bit. But I think one more thing worth mentioning. People compare the current period with a period which was 
pretty extraordinary and unlikely in terms of the number of players who developed over a short period. I mean, I, you know, the great great effort was put in by people like Leonard Barden and, and people like that over the 1970s and, and 80s. But, you know, to produce the number of really strong players that the UK did in the 1980s and 90s, it's, it's a pretty long shot. You know, I'd say that's an outlier. And, you know, if you're going to try to replicate that, you're going to have to do something fairly extraordinary. And, and you know, we do have some... We do have some strong players coming through. And I have some optimism that the generation I've been working with um, kind of, it's been an age range, but mostly 10 to 12 year olds. This this generation, I think, will produce some more very strong players. But it's 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 going to be difficult to replicate what, what happened 20 or 30 years ago. Yeah, that's good to hear. And I do think that, that cost of living also becomes a factor um, depending on... Yeah where people are coming up. I mean, it's always going to be on a country by country basis when you evaluate sort of the, uh, the state of the, the chess culture. But um, it's, you know, when you talked about incentives, I mean, it, it made me think of like, if you're committed to staying in Great Britain, you, you need to make sure you can, you can um, support that. Um, which, which with chess, if you're playing for prize money instead of, I mean, it's, it's easier than ever to be a working professional in chess, but not necessarily a chess player. Um, a professional chess player only. Um, Barry, do you have any um, any perspective on this? Yeah, it's it's um, it, it's not particularly an area of, of of expertise. I need to be very cautious in any thoughts um, here, Ben. And and I'm I'm really struck by uh, by, by Peter's analysis there as well. Um, th- there is, I think, a distinction to be drawn between uh, young players setting out on a professional life, experiencing the difficulties that that Peter's addressed. And if you're lucky enough to be a uh, a very young uh, player, I'm, I'm thinking here a young child with support of parents who can carry the financial right. load for you. Um, I, I, I I do think we, we, we miss out on some really very, very promising young players who are around about the age they go off to university, et cetera, and find themselves left to their own devices, find it very difficult to keep going and make that transition. Um, you know, so I'm not quite sure when we're going to see another Luke or Garwain or David coming in now. Of course, all in their in in their thirties. I, I very much hope hope we do. Uh, the the other brief point to make is uh, we, we're very fortunate to have things like the London Chess Classic, which uh, until this year uh, has become a real fixture, uh, and 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 from its inception has always been about providing an inspirational opportunity, as Peter was describing the Lloyd's Bank was for already really strong players. But for those at very, very much earlier stages through the Chess in Schools uh, and Communities uh, initiative, and that's always had a really strong focus on young people in state schools um, who would not otherwise um, perhaps have the opportunity uh, to explore chess uh, in a way which is going to uh, really excite and enthuse them. Uh, and, you know, I, I think we've got a lot to be thankful for. And I've no doubt that we're going to see some kids coming through at some point who benefited from those those sorts of opportunities. Yeah, I am Michael Payne, Malcolm Payne, of course, one of the driving forces behind those. And uh, yeah, we're it's great to to it's great that people uh, put forth the effort and gather the resources to to put on those events. London Chess Classic is definitely on my list of uh, tournaments. I'll um, I'd like to go to someday. Um, so Barry, by the way, are you? Are you did I read correctly? You're from South Africa originally? I am. Yeah, I can, I can make the accent a lot stronger if you need it to be. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's that's my background. So uh, let's, um, I mean, I don't want to only talk about British chess, being that you're originally from South Africa. What's what's chess like in uh, South Africa? I'm, I'm many years divorced from it, uh, though I've kind of kept a, you know, a, an interest from, from a distance, certainly in recent years since I came back to came back to chess. Um, at, at the time that I left the country in 1983, we didn't have a single title player. Um, we've now got several IMs. I say we, you know, South Africa has, uh, and uh, so far, uh, one GM. Um, and uh, th- th- there are reasons for that. Um, South Africa was, in my opinion, quite rightly excluded in the cultural boycott during the apartheid years. Uh, but as a result, there were fewer opportunities for our leading players to to get that regular experience. Um, but nonetheless, you know, um, strong players have, 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 have always found a way through to their level. But where they've really struggled is in converting their basic talents into, into titles. Um, 
there I think they really needed access to regular high level competition, which only really came about uh, once once apartheid um, you know was uh, was was it was was got rid of and uh, and and we saw some some really talented players emerge at that point. Well, uh, yeah, and hopefully with the sort of uh, flattening of the earth with the the advent of the internet, it's a slightly more level playing field. Although there's still the issue of resources we were discussing, even <clears throat> as it relates to British chess. Um, but certainly, it would be great to um, to see more strong players get what they need coming from South Africa and Africa uh, more generally. Um, so I want to pivot to another topic. We kind of have two related questions from listeners. Um, one of them, we kind of already, you guys basically answered in full. So I want to give a shout out to Michael Allard, who uh, I'll just quickly read his question, which he says, um, it appears that most adult chess players stay around the same rating for long stretches of their lives. I'm sure amount and quality of study varies, but a stagnant rating seems to be the norm. Is it possible that rating gain is the wrong goal, <clears throat> excuse me, since it's so elusive and difficult, can't improvement also be a g- gaining a greater understanding of the game without a rating increase? Do you think this could be a healthier, more enjoyable, and more attainable goal? Separately, are adult chess players too concerned with rating increases? And Barry, you basically answered that verbatim. So I'll, I'll also dive into the, the next question, uh, which we haven't touched on as much, and then you guys can um, kick around them as you wish. So this one is from Vishnu Srikar, and just a bit of Srikumar, excuse me, Vishnu. Um, just to give a bit of context, my friends over at uh, Chess Dojo, I am David Proust, GM Jesse Cry, and I am Kostya Kovutsky. They made a video where they kind of uh, tackled, I mean, not even tackled, they just kind of like um, punted around the topic of sort of talent in chess and like what what one could achieve given certain like, you know, if you... Could anyone make master? Could anyone make grandmaster? Those kind of questions. And um, there's there's a lot of disagreement, fervent disagreement. Um, and Vishnu is um, firmly on the side that uh, uh, people like Jesse and Kostya and myself, to, to cop to it, don't give people enough credit. And we attribute sort of too much to um, nature as opposed to nurture. Um, so Vishnu um, and and Vishnu is a, a neuroscientist by trade. So he, he knows his topic, to be fair. And we're just, you know, chess philosophers. <laughs> so um, uh, with, with that background out of the way, I'll uh, read Vishnu's question. So Vishnu says, some people believe that chess rating plateaus, regardless of where they occur, 1600, 1800, 2000, have a significant contribution from biological factors, e.g. genetic influences. Do you believe that biology determines rating plateaus that we see all the time with adult chess players? If not, do you think that someone stuck in the 1800 for, 1800s for years can be raised out of that plateau to, say, 2000 with the right training, motivation, and adjustment of other life factors? So there's the million-dollar question for you, Barry. What do you think? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. Uh, it is the most challenging question for the authors of a book on, on, on mindset. Um, but I would confront it head on. I, I would say that uh, we need to accept that there is clearly going to be a genetic element in, uh, in, in anyone's play. Um, it would be, it'd be stupid to say that uh, whatever uh, we, 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 we think intelligence is, uh, it's not going to play a role. And we do know from the studies that there is a small but nonetheless significant relationship, correlation between IQ uh, and chess skill. So, you know, it, it is there, uh, but it is relatively modest. Um, I, I, w- I, would, I would come at the other side of the kind of Robert Plowman and the um, chromosomal genetic uh, analysis of, of chess and say, absolutely, um, because I'm currently at a grading of 1800 doesn't mean I can improve uh, on that. Um, so I would, I would, I would, I would definitely say uh, the fact that most adult players do tend to stagnate around a particular, uh, a particular rating, whatever that is, is undeniable. Um, there will be reasons for that, uh, and it's probable that we we've, we've got our established work schedules, training schedules. They're not shifted much in 10, 20, 30 years. It'd be an amazing surprise, you know, if we made massive gains in our 40s or 50s, unless we did something a little bit differently. Uh, and that's what we try and address in the book. You know, given that there are limited but nonetheless really strong routes to chess improvement, how do we make sure we do the very best bits of those in terms of 
feeding intrinsic motivation, uh, seeking out the right levels of challenge, getting high quality feedback, coping well with faith, those kinds of things uh, is what can help us all progress. Um, we actually quote Bobby Fischer, who you know says many wonderful, disarming, simple, um, hit you in the face things in in his lifetime, and 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 one that really struck us and we included was, I believe that anyone can become a master. And almost with his next breath, he says, I know people who've got all the will in the world, but they can't play good chess. Right. And and the joy is reconciling those two apparently paradoxical. Uh, comments. I don't think they are paradoxical. You know, I think I think there's a, a clear explanation for why, even though I might want to be a master, I'm not. Uh, and, and that goes back many years and, and probably impacts on my current practice too. Um, but just because a rating stays stagnant does not mean it will always stay stagnant. That way lies, you know, the, the horrible dark world of gen genetic determinism. Uh, and, and if you know anything from chess, it's that chess does reward the right kind of effort. Uh, and we we need to hang on to that. Right. And as you say, there may be some sort of uh, intrinsic plateau that maybe a person has, but that doesn't mean that you're at it. <laughs> no, <laughs> absolutely. Maybe you're pl plateauing below your sort of uh, peak plateau. Um, and, 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 and nor will we ever know when right. we're at that plateau. Yeah. Um, that's when plateaus happen is when we think we've reached it. Yeah. You know, as, as, as long as we can keep deferring that. And, 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 and Peter will tell you, you know, uh, he, he quotes Mickey in, in his interview. And Mickey says, I've been really good at not limiting myself in my career you know and here he is in his late 40s still playing at an elite level and he he, he said in his interview you know, i'm quite surprised i'm still playing at this level but he puts that down to the fact that he's never imposed any kind of limits at the age of 40 you should see tailing off you know all the kind of stereotypes that uh, that people like mickey and boris gelfand and victor korchnoi robert smizlov and mike tarmanov you know have ha have, have proven to be to be false yeah. And I also just wanted to mention the quote that you guys had in the book from Carol Dweck herself, that uh, talent is a starting point um, in yeah. terms of uh, how people address it. So, Peter, again, I, I'd like to get your perspective, both from having known so many top players, from having worked with Mickey Adams himself and um, from from training young players. What do you see in terms of talent? Because I think part of the reason that people like um, uh, myself and uh, Jesse Cry and Kostya came down kind of on a different side of the argument than Vishnu is. As teachers, we we see people assimilate things at a very different rate. Um, and to me, there's there's just no getting around that. I mean, if you you know anyone who's who's taught kids, like if you if you can it's you can predict who's going to accelerate at what rate. Now, of course, that could change over time, and things aren't set in stone. But I think that that's part of the reason that that chess trainers might come down on a different side. What what has been your experience? How have you generally uh, thought about this, uh, Peter? And has it changed at all? Yeah, it has changed somewhat because I think again, as I said in the book, I, I think I had a fairly strong view that talent put a kind of glass ceiling on what you could achieve at some point and almost certainly suffered from that. Um, it sort of slots in quite nicely with a bit of uh, imposter syndrome or whatever you're feeling at the time. So, yeah, I, I think, <clears throat> but my views have definitely changed. I mean, like Barry, I think it would be absurd to deny that there's some genetic influence and we have all worked with players who, are, who, who learn things more easily, let's put it that way. But again, you know, I... I one thing which came from what Barry mentioned, Luke McShane had said earlier, was the point that, you know, sometimes you're working with people and it's easy to overlook what they've already kind of subliminally absorbed. So, you know, I, I'm working with Luke and he has a, even at a relatively, I, I didn't work with him when he was very young. Um, but, you know, by the time I at least got to know him quite well, uh, he'd absorbed a huge amount of material, which could easily look like uh, some kind of, pure talent but is in fact the product of a great deal of as he said massively enjoying reading chess um, but of course people learn at different speeds and the important thing is is to learn as efficiently as you can given that given that limitation i suppose um yeah mickey was interesting mickey i'm again this is something i mentioned in the book but i think it's very interesting mickey to me has the, the greatest thing that jumped out at me when working with him was how quickly he had a feel for what was important. I think in the book I described it as a great filter. He basically, you know, you, you, I would present him with a whole bunch of material and he would 
incredibly quickly decide which part of it he needed, which part of it was significant to him. That I'm not, I'm not sure where that comes from. But again, you, it sort of seems natural to assume that comes in some way from from experience rather than rather than genetics. I mean, you might be, you might, you might inherit some kind of ability to home in on the important. But I, I think it's mainly learned. Um, and you know, Luke, Luke, is, Luke's fascinating to work with because a lot of the time I'm, I'm on a reasonably similar mind way with him, and then suddenly he will have. Um, a view on a position which is very different from mine. And sometimes he can explain very well why this is, and other times less so. But you, I just sort of, at that moment, I sense uh, a much bigger difference than I'm aware of, you know, was aware of during most of our work. So I'm putting this present tense. And it's actually, it's the most, re- he's the most recent, very strong player I've worked with, but it's a little bit past. Yeah, and, and sometimes you just, you know, a slightly different way of looking at chess will produce a hugely different uh, a hugely different conclusion from him, and and sometimes yeah, those are those have been big learning experiences for me because it just takes a little bit of something. But again, I think you know he he was very clear on the fact that this this early reading and reading as a passion rather than reading as a sort of ritual or a duty was was the thing which had given him such a broad knowledge of different positions. I think you know what we're doing in chess a lot of the time is well, they say pattern recognition or you know we're comparing different things without really knowing that's what we're doing. You're comparing with something you've seen before. And I think Luke has a, a vast database of positions which he's kind of absorbed in a more philosophical sense. You know, he's not he's not by nature a, a, a rote learner, but he, he will have absorbed a ton of things which then lead him to, to interesting and different conclusions. I, I, you know, working with Luke was a hugely enjoyable, hugely enjoyable experience. Yeah, I, I can only imagine. Um, and are there any sort of uh, so? You, I mean, you guys interviewed so many top uh, British players. Um, so what what else did you notice in terms of? And we should mention like Harriet Hunt, David Howell, Matthew Sadler, uh, GM Luke McShane. Apologies uh, for Mickey Adams. Apologies for anyone I'm forgetting. You guys can Nigel uh, Nigel Short. Nigel Short, yeah, and, all and Gawain, Gawain Jones. Gawain Jones, yeah, going to, uh, who's who of uh, yeah. British chess. Um, so. What did you guys notice in terms of uh, similarities across uh, all of these super strong players? Were were you more struck by the similarities in their approach or the differences? Um, to some extent, the differences, I guess. But well, I mean, one of the clear similarities, uh, touching on something we mentioned before, was was kind of, I think, all of them had you could describe in some way as having had supportive parents, but not parents who were pushing them too hard. I think that was one of the sort of ground, that was one of the fundamental similarities, which probably carries an awful lot of weight through the whole process. In terms of their um, approaches after that, some, I think most of them had had, as I said before, a period where reading chess, about chess was a passion. You know, it was something they did, and, and it wasn't something they did because they felt they had to, but because primarily they were enjoying it. You know, car journeys, uh, baths in one case, that kind of thing. It was uh, very much, you know, just something they did. That was a that was a common approach. Then there were some differences. So Gawain and Gawain Jones and David Howell tended to emphasize the amount that they played in their early years as being very important. So they were doing it very much on the playing side. It, uh, Gawain said, you know, Gawain clearly worked incredibly hard on his chess, but that kind of came later. Again, I would say everybody had had a period of hard work very intense hard work but that these happened at different stages of a career so even for mickey for example i think he he got incredibly far without a period of intense work to compare with what he did say in his late 20s early 30s something like that i think he he sort of came to very methodological very very sorry methodical work at, at quite a late stage and the point where i was working with mickey was very much in the middle of that phase and they were very they were tough working days, you know. But there were differences in when more than in how with that. But there were also, you know, differences in ter- which we explore in the metacognition chapter in terms of people working on their strengths or working on their weaknesses, that kind of thing. People, some people who wanted to create a rounded style, other people who were very happy to kind of go down one particular path and and try and use those use their use their sort of their best skills and were happy for a while to sideline their weaknesses. So there were differences in approach to that degree, for sure. Huh. 
And just a follow up, since you mentioned that you noticed that uh, all these top players, um, their parents seem to strike the right balance. So we have a question from Michael Allard, who who asks, he says, on parenting, um, and, and either of you could take this, um, how do you find the correct parenting balance between teaching discipline, hard work, responsibility, but also being supportive and nurturing? One doesn't want to be tyrannical about chess, but it's probably not good to teach a child that it's okay to quit if something is difficult. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's a question which affects all of us as as parents. To to what extent do we want to have a little bit of the Chinese tiger mother in us? Right. Uh, and to, to to what extent is it you know going to be um, okay, kids? You choose your own curriculum, and and, and I'll support you, and 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 uh, that, that's okay with me. Um, I would hope that at our best, we don't need to see them as binary opposites. Um, but at our best, that's only going to be because kids are the drivers. I mean, what, one of the points that, that Tim makes in his contribution is uh, the best work your child is ever going to do is the work that they're driven to do by themselves. Uh, and, and, and that was something that really jumped out at Henrik uh, as, as, as something which featured in his memory and, and knowledge of his son. You know, Magnus did the work himself. And it's so important that we create the opportunities for kids to see how fun and exciting chess is. And then we don't need to come at them with a big stick. We can simply facilitate um, their choosing to spend the time. I, I, I would hope the problem becomes then, how do we limit the time so they can get you right. know, other childhood experiences uh, as well? So um, yes, um, hard work and not quitting is, is important, but the real genius, and this is where I think Henrik is so modest about what he must have managed in doing no harm, to, to, to Magnus and his children um, is you, you, you've got to be really cute to find ways of communicating to your son or daughter uh, that um, you're going to support them in their hard work um, w- without carrot or stick, uh, but simply by creating the conditions in which they want to invest that time for themselves. Uh, clearly, uh, Henrik managed that. Um, though he says he just, you know, try to facilitate and do no harm. You know, as Peter points out, the family uprooted to spend time in different country at a formative stage in Magnus's life. That's quite a, quite a big upheaval that the family committed to in, in, in support of that. So, um, if we can use the right approaches, and we, t- we talk about a number of these, particularly in the chapter on, on motivation, going easy on the praise, particularly all the identity-based praise, we stand a much better chance of the child being drawn to the intrinsic pleasures in chess, where they want to invest for themselves, not because mum or dad has promised them 50 quid if they get X points at this tournament or reach this rating. Um, there we see real risks, that at the point that those rewards um, are no longer available for whatever reason, that's the point these children begin to give up because the intrinsic motivation has been supplanted by the extrinsic factors. Yeah, and it's hard because in chess, unlike, say, if your your kid is into football slash soccer, um, it's so measurable. Your progress is so measurable with a rating that it's really hard to disassociate from the sort of uh, extrin- extrinsic judgment that one would give based on a rating. Um, so how many times, yeah. if you were introducing chess to a kid and they just, they're just not interested, like how many times would you try, Barry? I'm just curious. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, and, and Peter uses a conversation that he had with Moraine van Delft, the, you know, well-known Dutch trainer and, and author and, and, and master. Uh, and, and the comment was, was lovely. He simply said, I don't do motivation. Yeah. That's Kids great. either love chess or they don't. Yeah. You know, and, 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 and in a sense, uh, I, I think we're, we're fighting an uphill battle uh, if we're trying to communicate our love of chess to a child who just doesn't get it. Um, we, it's great for them to see how much pleasure we get out of it, and it's great for them to be um, you know, taken to the water, but, but I don't believe we can make them drink um, or make them drink at this time. Maybe at some stage in the future you know, they, they may wish to. And I don't want to get all kind of depth psychology, psychoanalytic about this, but the, the numbers of chess grandmasters whose sons or daughters are also chess grandmasters is vanishingly small. I can't think of of, of, of many, if, if, if any of them. Yeah. yeah, no, it's, it's, and I don't think that's entirely, entirely surprising. If you try to make your own way in the world, um, part of your job as a, as a child is in a sense to, um, to, to split from, from, from parental influence at some point. 
um, you know, it's it's great if you share the same love. There, there are plenty of cases, of course, where you know fathers and sons and daughters do have a shared passion, but not necessarily to the very highest levels. I think of the Heidenfelds, for instance, drawing back on the South African connection again and the Irish connection of of, of, his, of his son. Both play chess to a very high level, um, but but they're relatively few. They're relatively few, and um, that that may not be entirely surprising. Yeah, I love that quote about I don't do motivation. Um, that that's the good sort of grounding for for trainers. And and as a parent, I've introduced my my daughter's only four, but my son is seven, so he's been exposed to chess a few times. And so far, it hasn't really taken. But I have noticed um, if I ask him to do chess kid or something like that, he's not he's not super fired up to do it. But he will if he sees me playing blitz for fun or something like that. He's he's more inclined to then ask. He doesn't like to play me because um, I'm not really going to let him win. But he'll ask my wife to play um, if he sees me having fun doing it. So it is interesting how that works. Ben, could I just add a couple yeah, of things? Sorry. Of course. Yeah, sorry, two things. Firstly, um, I'm kind of thinking that what, what one thing that I really – don't like seeing his parents where you where you feel the child is simply being pushed. I mean, that does feel very unhealthy. Where I think it's trickier is where the child has obviously shown considerable intrinsic motivation and interest, but has reached one of those tricky periods of setbacks where yeah. then a little bit of extra parental pushing is probably helpful. And I guess the tricky question then is, you know, how you push. Clearly, you try kind of not carrot in the <laughs> carrot in the uh, sort of Stick, yeah. motivation sense, but ways of ways uh, of trying to reinfuse. I suppose that my first instinct would be to try and try try and reinfuse them in some way. Try and remind. I mean, I, for example, when I've been working with young players who who have had a rough time, I, I just sometimes say to them, "Look, go back and 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 check through some of your best games. Just remind yourself what you can do. Remind yourself of the pleasure of." Of not just winning, but winning in a, in a, in a beautiful way. Remind you, and I, I also intri- increasingly um, have understood the value of studies and things. Just just to remind people of the beauty in the game. Remind you, remind them of why they loved it in the first place. Because you know sometimes, the, 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 as we've discussed with plateaus, the, the the tricky period can go on quite a long time. But you just need to reinvigorate out that re- reinvigorate that fire. And then the other thing I wanted to say I, I, I was more speaking as a parent. I mean, I'm quite lucky because my, my elder daughter is intrinsically motiv- motivated to do a number of things that I regard of as, as very worthwhile and, and you know, that, I, that I'm fully supportive of. I wonder, and, and I certainly haven't pushed her in the direction of chess. If anything, she's sometimes come to me and said, can we do some chess, Dad, which is, which is obviously mm-hmm. great. But um, I just wonder how, whether I would be quite such a great liberal parent if I felt that all of the things she was doing <laughs> were not going to, you know, contribute the kind of skills and, and um, characteristics that, that I guess as parents we want to promote. That's where I wonder, you know, I, I think it's very easy to feel liberal, liberal about it when your child is doing some worthwhile pursuits. And I've been, you know, I've, quite a, I've been very, very keen to promote the idea that she does some sport and some physical activity alongside her academic stuff because she's one of those naturally quite academic kids and, and she enjoys that stuff and that's great but you know I, I think that that presents a bit more of a challenge to the sort of parental liberalism if, if your child is not attracted to any of these things. Yeah I know that uh, Angela Duckworth who's research i'm sure you guys also have come across she talks about a, a so this is more for parents than trainers but like a one hard thing framework where she says um you're you're going to do one hard thing per semester but you can pick what it is so if you know if if it's chess one semester and then you get sick of chess you can move on to piano it's totally up to you but you're going to do it and you're not going to quit during that semester so that's something i've kept in mind with as a parent but again my youngest is only 7 and We've got him doing piano, and he hasn't pushed back that hard yet. So we haven't had to introduce it as like a explicit rule yet. But, but I do think it's useful. What do you think of that uh, framework? It's, 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 it's. I think it's really, really good advice. And and and, and we do reference um, Angela's work on 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 grit and resilience and stickability uh, in 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 the book. Um, there is there is there is a sense that we'd love children to experience that satisfaction that comes from achieving something at the end of a process of really hard work and setbacks. I mean, there is something so divine about that kind of satisfaction 
rather than the kind of the easy wins and the quick successes, which, you know, we, we tend not to value so much. So whatever it is, I mean, obviously, given our interest, we, we would hope this would be for children in, in, in chess to um, choose a domain which is intrinsically high in challenge and to see yourself making small incremental gains in response to that is such an intrinsic motivator in its own right. And it doesn't need anyone actually to say, well done, or aren't you making good progress, or, or any of the more facile things. It's quite quite tempting for us to say. Okay, great. Yeah. So, I mean, we could talk about this for hours, but uh, but we're, we're running low on time, and I have a few more Patreon questions. So um, if you guys don't mind, um, let's... Uh, so, Peter, let's start with... Uh, with this one from Deshaun Solomon, um, you know, usually a player of your stature with your experience, I'd be like plying you for stories throughout the interview. But we had so much to talk about in terms of uh, your book that we haven't haven't delved into it much. So we have one in particular, which I understand is a frequently cited story. But this question is from uh, Deshaun Solomon. And uh, Deshaun says, uh, how, what was it like beating Alexei Shirov with the Trumpovsky, a game Peter won in 13 moves? Also, uh, he follows up by saying... Uh, Peter Wells wrote a book on the Trumpovsky in 2003, which I love. Do you plan to have an updated book on the Trumpovsky? Um, okay, I'll start. I'll start with the second question. I'm uh, where I'm. I fear I may be going to disappoint, at least in the short term. I kind of, at some point, decided that I'd written uh, quite a considerable number of opening books, and whilst they were um, they were quite fun to do at times, and they were also quite useful to me while I was while I was playing a lot of chess and developing as a player, even, you know, in a, probably more than I am now in some ways. Uh, and I kind of thought that I probably wanted to diversify my writing a bit and move away from opening books, at least for a time. So at the moment, I'm definitely planning to write more, but I'm thinking along probably more middle game lines than any more opening books. Um, and so the Trombovsky may have to wait until I have a, a bit of a change of phase on that one. I'm very glad to very glad he enjoyed the book, but uh, I'm afraid I'm, I can't promise a follow-up at the moment. Um, as for beating Alexis Shirov, well, it was very, it was basically above all very odd. I mean, when you're playing a sort of 2700 legend, the one thing you don't expect to do is basically win the game just because they forget their theory. So you know, there was sadly there was nothing new in the game at all. I think, except I think at one point he played a move which was even worse than the move which had occurred in the game we were following, which made, you know, the uh, the advantage I got and, and the sort of conversion of it, which would have followed had he not had enough fairly quickly, uh, even easier. So, you know, from a creative angle, there was really nothing there at all. Um, obviously, from a sort of results perspective, it's just, it's just great every time you beat a 2700 player. But, you know, it doesn't feel like a creative achievement in any sense at all. Um, and Alexei was obviously a bit, a bit annoyed at the end, so we didn't get, we didn't get any uh, sort of. That wasn't a game with a post mortem, you can probably imagine. So um, <laughs> you know, it was it was a very odd experience, and it, it you know it's it's not sort of in a sense something you want to be. It's not what I want to be remembered for, but it was obviously a nice thing to happen at the time in in, in some ways. You know, it's back to sort of results against you know, creative enjoyment. And it, it scored very heavily on the results thing, but on the creative achievement, it wasn't really there. So what what does come to mind when you think about your, your greatest creative achievement? Um, it's a bit difficult to say. I put my favorite move in the book, which was played against Sultan Almashi, who's obviously no no mean player either. I mean, he was, he was, I think, he was quite young at the time it happened, but he was already kind of 25 100 rating and pushing up towards 2600 and, and obviously went a lot higher than that subsequently. That was probably one of my, that was probably my favorite achievement as an individual move. And I've played a few games I'm, I'm quite pleased with. Um, one against John Ems, which I discussed in my interview with uh, Matthew Sadlow and, and Natasha Regan, which probably is, yeah, it's sort of stuck in my head as my favorite over the years. I think, I, yeah, I think I probably have, as I said in the book, I have a, a fairly high number of, uh, sort of visually pleasing games because I play quite attacking chess. But because of the time travel, I have a really frustrating number of uh, almost visually pleasing near misses as well. Uh -huh. That's really, uh, that's the tough thing. So, you know, uh, but those, it's the it's the ones where there is some real chess content to be proud of that stick in my, stick in my mind. I mean, I've had a few other nice results, but I can't remember a time when I've 
beaten a very strong player in what I regard as a really great game. That's the combination I'm still looking for. Well, you, you've still got some time. And what about just generally stories just from, from being friendly with so many of these uh, chess heroes and sharing meals and drinks? Do you have any uh, memorable stories from that, Peter? Um, I'm just trying to think. I, I, I can only think of a slightly uh, uh, one which uh, one of the players might, might slightly object to. <laughs> when I was working per- with, sounds perfect. <laughs> yeah, it sounds perfect. When I was working with Joel, well, it's, it's sort of, you, you hear all these things about kind of hierarchy in the chess world. And do you remember Bill Hartston once said, Something like if, if chess players go through a revolving door, they go in raging order or something like that. And, you, mm-hmm. and, and most of my experience of the very top players is that they're in, incredibly welcoming and uh, you, you actually don't get all that much of that. But I did have one rather nice incident which enables me to do a bit of name dropping as well. I, I was When I was working for Joel Lottier, um, who which was an amazing experience anyway, because he is, you know, I talk about other people working hard and that kind of thing. He is just legendary in his hard work, um, absolute example, and, and of course the the hard work which he requires from his seconds as well. So it was, I, I actually got that role after Matthew Sadler. I think Matthew Sadler couldn't do some tournament, or maybe he couldn't do any work with him in, in the com- in the period that was coming. So uh, he he was kind enough to recommend me to to Joel Lutier as you know some, one of the English players who he thought also was in the kind of high work ethic department. But that was, uh, it was pretty t- tough to keep up with either, uh, we, we, we reference uh, Matthews in the book, either Matthews sort of approach to hard work or Joel's. And uh, so it was an incredibly demanding role. But I remember during our second tournament at the beginning, I was walking walking with Joel before the game, just trying to you know chat through a, lot, a few last things and um, just taking some air and that. And it was a very, very cold day. And I rather stupidly had kind of uh, just dressed in, I, was, I think I just had a shirt on in this freezing cold Dutch sort of October, November weather. And uh, Joel had sort of shirt, a couple of jackets and a coat. <laughs> you know, he was extremely well prepared. And and, I, and we saw Judith Poldo over the other side of the road. And, and she, she sort of said hi. And then she called over and said, aren't you cold? And before I could reply, Joel came back with, no, no, I'm fine. <laughs> 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 There's some wonderful hierarchy going on here, you know. <laughs> and, and normally, you know, that's, it's very unfair because normally he was uh, very, very nice to work with, and I felt very, uh, you know, respected as a person with him and everything. But it was just a wonderful moment of. Um, that's very funny. By the way. <laughs> Beautiful. I don't know if you caught this, uh, Peter or Barry, but he, in the recent Norway Cup, he was a guest um, of uh, GM Kramnik and the aforementioned GM Judah Polgar. So they kind of interviewed him while they were covering one of the rounds. The archive's available on YouTube. It was fantastic. He definitely, he climbed very quickly up the list of uh, people I would love to interview for this podcast. I mean, just amazing stories and perspective from his his time near the top. And it's good. It's always similar to, I mean, uh, Patrick, of course, not quite as strong as Joel Latier, but when I got to interview Patrick Wolf, who has stepped away from chess, but it really drives home the point that especially these super strong guys, but even Barry, like you came back to chess, I came back to chess, like it never fully leaves you. It's always there. You could still see the glint in Joel Latier's eyes. Um, so one more listener question, and then I think we should uh, wrap this up because unfortunately I have other work responsibilities. I could go on for hours, but we have another question, and this one is from uh, – actually, I think two more questions. This one is from Chessable Super user Peter Newhall, who had noticed, um, Barry, that you, um, you've begun uh, um, some work with Chessable. So Peter asks uh, – he says, uh, can you talk more about the practical questions you're hoping to understand through Chessable-related studies – for example, uh, Elijah Logazar is doing some casual, causal, excuse me, uh, observation concerning puzzle rush. Would you try to do some similar things, but in a more rigorous way to see how effective different types of material are for improving? Uh, yes, in, in a word, not necessarily with uh, puzzle rush. Uh, Ch- Chess.com have you know got a really interesting little initiative over there, and and uh, it, it's not necessarily something we're going to want to um, develop in 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 any way. Um, I- interesting uh, as it is, um, my, my personal interest in uh, looking at the learning science of chess development is 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 more in the um, perhaps less obviously enjoyable but potentially more useful terrain um, that are holy grail directions for, for chess things like um, neo transfer how, how do we 
how do we perhaps use metacognition to get um, developing players um, to make links between their existing store of chess knowledge uh, and the position on the board? Mm. Uh, in other words, make better moves, but not just because it seems like a good idea at the time, but they're, they're actually kind of drawing drawing what Peter was talking about, Luke, having this you know, really well-developed database of, 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 of strong judgments that he can call upon. Um, and there's some really interesting uh, work um, that's 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 uh, potentially going to be happening there, where we, we're going to be working with uh, researchers at the University of Sydney and the University of Harvard uh, on on the, the use of prompts um, to help players initially make connections between recently learned material uh, and relatively novel positions, uh, which ultimately allow transfer to happen. Um, and um, Grandmaster Alex Kolovich is, is going to be helping us with this. He's already recommended some openings we might want to be using to, to develop that. And that's all going to be um, something that we'd like to do and get some measurable metrics out there to uh, to have some reliable data um, to help us make make judgments about is this worth pursuing and building into the chessable program um, or, or not. Um, there, there are plenty of other um, little areas that, that, that we're looking at working with. The University of California, the research is very keen on looking at mental health in chess, particularly in the age of the pandemic uh, and the role that chess has played and can play and the reasons it plays uh, in keeping people sane rather than the stereotype of chess driving people mad. You know, that seemed to me like a very uh, neat way of inverting the, the, usual, the usual one. But yes, I mean, from the outset and certainly well before I was involved, um, learning science has been at the heart of Chessable, and, and I'm delighted to be playing a small role in, in making sure we keep it there. Cool. Yeah, we look forward to that. And if people want to see, um, like, keep up with the research, I'm, I'm imagining, I know you already had one interview through Chessable's blog. Like, will, will they be pushing it out that way, or is there a particular yep. way? Yeah, we're going to be we're going to be inviting our, our members, uh, those who wish to be involved in trying out some material. Uh, they'll be guinea pigs with no risk of contracting COVID <laughs> at the end of it as well. So we're, we're hoping for a good response there. Excellent. OK, well, well, so we didn't get to John Hartman's question. Apologies to my friend John. But um, but guys, this has been great. I definitely recommend the book. Um and yeah, there's just so much to learn from it. So um, anything to add uh, first, Peter, and then Barry, before we let you guys go? We lost the last 10 seconds of Peter's audio, but he said thank you and goodbye. On to Barry. Uh, yeah, no, just to say thanks for the opportunity. And, and, and to those folk who are kind enough to, to buy and read the book, um, any kind of feedback, including the, the critical feedback, would be very welcome, you know, because we suspect we'll be making changes to it over time. So, you know, do drop us an email through our publishers or directly through our websites, and we'd be we'd be keen to have it. Okay, great. And Peter, I know you have a brand new Twitter account. Um, Barry, are you on any social media? Is there any other way to reach you, or are those the preferred methods? Uh, w way too old to, to, to maintain a, a Twitter account. Peter's a spring chicken by comparison, Ben. But uh, um, I do have a website, and, and uh, you know, either through Chessable or my website, I'm fairly easily contacted. Okay, well, good good for you, staying off of social media. So, um, <laughs> Okay, well, thanks a lot, guys. This has been a lot of fun. Um, uh, I really appreciate you guys being so generous with your, your time. Um, and, and, yeah, look forward to uh, continued projects. Thank you very much. Special thanks, as always, to my producer, Matthew Passy, and thanks to those who continue to help spread the word about Perpetual Chess. You can spread the word via word of mouth or positive reviews on podcast platforms. We are up to 98 written reviews on Apple Podcasts, and only one of them aggravates me. Amazing support. By the way, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm at BennyFischel1, or join the Perpetual Chess Facebook group and continue the conversation about the latest interview. You should also check out the Perpetual Chess Instagram page. But more than anything, I want to express my gratitude to those who provide financial support to the show. Most of all, I want to thank Chessable.com for sponsoring the show and to everyone who kicks in via PayPal or the Perpetual Chess Patreon page to help sustain and improve the show. And while they're at it, find out about future guests and send in some great questions. So without further ado, I'd like to give special thanks to the following people and entities. They are Chessable.com, Quality Chess Books, the Capital City Chess Club, the Abysmal Depths of Chess blog, the Apprentice Twitch channel, Andrew Alharji, Andrew Bach, Andy Ryerson, Austin Clough, Benjamin Porto, Bill Sigler, Kathy Carr, Chad Oliver, the Charlotte Chess Center, 
the Chess Central's Chess Blog, ChessMood.com, Chris Flanagan, Dan O'Hanlon, Danny Davidson, David Schreiber, I am Dimitri Schneider, Drake Domingue, I am Eric Rosen, Firas Sawaf, Gary Foreman, Greg Harfst, Greg Natal, I am Greg Shahadi, Guven Manet, James Kennedy, Jens Green, John Jernigan, John Rockefeller, John Cromarty, John MacArthur, Kelly Palmer, Kevin O'Callaghan, King Sell, Lucio Casada Silva, The Law Offices of Stuart Katz, LilaAnalysis.com for cloud-based Leela Engine Analysis, Michael Can, FM Michael Oblin, Mike Zelazny, Mr. Mike Shahadi, The Famous Mr. Dodgy, The Nerd Nays Twitch Channel, Peter Sadi, The Play More Chess Academy of the Hamden Chess Club, Reuven Fisher, Robert Coucher, Seattle Chess Club, Shane Unger, Stephen Kelty, Stephen Martinez, Thomas Stenix, Thomas Tachenko, Todd Bryan of StrongChess.com, Todd Kennedy, Wayne Beam, and I would also like to thank Aaron Waffler, Ace Viega, Adam Ralph of ChessEngland.com, Adrian Gutierrez, Alex Pejas, Andy Ryerson, FM Andre Terakov, Dr. Andrew Perry, Anidi Deer, Barry Hessian, Bill Juniper, Bill Moran, Brad and Andy Rosen, Brett Howard Lynn, Brian Mullis, Bruce Scott, Brian Tillis of Palm Beach Chess, Chad Hilton, Dr. Charles Snodgrass, Chris Wayne Scott, Christopher Baumgartner, Christopher Shabri, Chris Lott, Christopher Wood, I am Christoph Zalecki, aka Chess Explain, Coach Jay's Chess Academy, Costa Carras, Courtney Fry, Craig Mallon, Daniel Ginsburg, Daniel Naylor, Dave Saylor, David Bleskacek, David Cramley of Chessable.com, Dalen Shelton, Dirk Decker, Drake Domingue, Dwayne Edmonds, Ed Daly, Ethan Smith, Hallelujah Cat, Ian Mason, FM, Donnie Ariel, Fox Valley Chess Club, Francis Latart Lavoie, Frank Tortoris MD, Frank Zananis, Gary Andrews, Gary Lewis, Geert Vandervelt, Gerard Barta, Giovanni Russo, Han Schut, Harish Srinivasan, Jacob Kovach, Jacques Perry, James Aspinwall, James Bonastia, James Muir, Jason Woolham, J. Deep Chakrabarty, Jeff Anderson, Jeffrey Martello, Yep Horland, Jerry Wells, Jim Ratliff, J.J. Stranad, Dr. John Fallon, John Fernandez, John Fontaine, John Hartman, John Jeffrey, John McMurtry, Jonathan Slater, Jose Rodriguez, Justin Gardner, Jen Shahadi, Joel Rocky, John Thompson, Grandmaster Josh Friedel, I am Kare Christensen, WGM Katerina Nemsova, Kelly Palmer, Kevin Pryor, I am Kostya Kovutsky, Krishna Gopala Krishnan, Kyle McAvoy, Larry Reifworth, Laura Boyowski, Martin Knudsen, Martin Krug, Matthew Passy, Matthew Tedesco of SeattleChessMeetup.org, the Mechanics Institute Chess Club of San Francisco, Michael Allard, Michael Hudson, Miguel Arispide, Mike Clem, Mitchell Fabian, Nate Solom, Neil Bruce, Negmat, Milad Janov, Olaf Mueller Michaels, GM Pascal Charbonneau, Passy Passanen, Paul Bain, Paul Clarkson, Paul Sweeney, Paulo Santana, Peter Lux, Randy Temple, Ricky Grijalvo, Richard Hollenbach, Robert Turner, Roy Yearwood, Ryan Berg, The Say Chess YouTube Channel, Scott Doherty, Scott McKinnon, Sebastian Finsterwater, Shane Unger, Stefan Roller, WGM Tata of Abrahamian, Tim Brennan of TacticsTime.com, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, Tom Edsel, Tomas Komanich, Tony Rotella, Tyron Price, Vishnu Srikumar, William H. Brock, William Juniper, William Hogarth, William Peterson, FM Zhao Chang of Chess1000.com, and Zhivko Stoyanov. Thanks, as always, for listening, and I will catch you all next week.